All right, well, we've been in a, a series entitled Cause and Effect. And uh, based it off of Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, and it just simply says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please their spirit will reap eternal life. And so the whole concept is that we play a role in the outcome of our life. Our choices, our actions, the things that we do. There's a reason why God has given, this, given us this wonderful book of guidelines. He lovingly has laid out his plan and his purpose and how we should live and the things that we should do because he wants us to walk in the fullness of what he has. He doesn't want us to go down the, you know, the path of hurt and heartache. So the first week, I, I preached a message entitled Receive the Word. Any of the messages are available online, uh, either on our website or on uh, our YouTube channel. But receiving the Word is a whole lot different than hearing the Word. Receiving the Word is when you understand that this is God speaking to you, and you open up your, your heart, and you allow the Word to go down deep and to sow seed so that it can actually begin to bring forth fruit. In other words, if you receive the word, you're not just a hearer. You're a doer of the word. You're actually applying the principles to your life and doing what God's word says. And then I talked last week about walking in wisdom, and I contrasted the difference between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. And that's a battle every day we've got to fight. We've got to shut down worldly wisdom, which includes our own thoughts and our own ideas and our own concepts of what we think we should do. And then we've got to begin to transform the way that we think. And then the last point I made was that we need to choose contentment. And I think it's interesting because we are such a conditional people. Like so much of our life is hinged on what what does or doesn't happen around us. And, we, and we're not used to fully relying on God. And I had that box of contentment. And I started pulling things out, relationships, circumstances, all of the things that we, we look to to determine whether or not we're going to walk in peace or walk in joy. And when I was all done, the box was empty because ultimately, true contentment only comes from Christ. Christ. And everything we need is found in Him. So when we're, we're in Him, we don't need anything else. We're complete. We're not a bunch of, as believers, we shouldn't be a bunch of needy people walking around trying to get fulfilled from others and from stuff. It's, ama it's amazing how many people go into relationships because they're empty. I need you to, to fill me. I, I need you to give something to me. And if you don't give it to me, I'm not going to be content. I'm not going to be at peace. But man, when you have a marriage or friendship where you have two people who are complete in Christ, then all they're doing is out of the overflow, loving and serving one another. It's so much better. It's so much healthier. And so we got to make sure that we are finding everything we need in Christ. And so I want to open up today's thoughts out of Philippians chapter 4. And I want to look at verses 6 and 7. Fairly common scripture. But it says, do not be anxious about anything. Now, some of us translate that as it's okay to be anxious sometimes because there's some things that are like pretty major, right? Like there, there's sometimes where it's okay to lose your peace or lose your cool or it's totally understandable that you're a mess right now, you know? No. It's, it's literally saying do not be anxious about anything. In other words, whatever emotion starts rising up inside of you, you have the ability through Christ to deal with it, right? But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, if you notice, there's many components to that. Some of us might throw up a prayer, but we don't throw up the thanksgiving. Some of us might, you know, pray over one situation, but not every situation, He's literally saying the way to not be anxious about anything is to give everything to God, invite him into every situation, and then just begin to worship and focus on him. And when you do those things, the peace of God, and I love this, the peace of God. It doesn't say the answer happens. And when the answer happens, then you have peace. It's like, no, when you pray, when you give everything to him, the immediate answer is peace. All right, I don't have to carry this anymore. I don't have to do this on my own. I don't have to figure out 
anything. It's in God's hands, right? The peace of God which transcends all understanding. In other words, you can't wrap your brain around it. That's what's going to guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, if we look at that same passage in the message, which is a paraphrase, it's kind of like a, it has a cool way of looking at it. Here, 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 here's that paraphrase. It says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Oh, you mean there's more you can do besides freaking out? Yeah, you can actually pray. And then it says, let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. <laughs> oh my goodness, so we can take that, that crazy thought, those crazy emotions that are going on, and we can begin to shape them into prayers to God, which is inviting him into the situation, letting God know your concerns. Nothing wrong with letting him know. Nothing wrong with, you know, letting it out as long as you're letting it out to the right people. You see, too many times we cast our cares on our spouse. We cast our cares on our friends. We, we, we cast our cares on the checkout person who really doesn't care and, what, like, and goes, why are you telling me this? I don't want to hear, you know. You see people like that, they're just unloading at Walmart, and you're like, um... Do you not have any friends anywhere to talk to? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, come on, unload on God, right? It says, and before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, which is everything coming together for good, that will come in and it'll settle you down. It's amazing how as a parent we can say that to our kids. You need to calm down. You need to just relax. It's not as bad as you think it is. Quit crying, quit freaking out, quit throwing a fit, just settle down. I think sometimes, sometimes as adults, we need somebody to walk up to us and go, you need to stop freaking out. You need to stop talking right now. You need to go into your prayer closet and you need to talk with God because you're a mess. What would we do if somebody said that to us? We'd be, oh yeah? Well, here's what's going on. I'm, I'm like, we'd be all defensive and we'd want to fight and we'd be all insulted. And, but like, come on. Sometimes we just need to settle down. It, said, it, it says it's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry that is at the center of your life. So in other words, when we're freaking out, we are putting those circumstances, those situations at the center of our life. But when we invite God in, that stuff's not center stage anymore. So I want to talk to you today about a message I'm entitled, Do Not Fret. Do not fret. You may say you don't fret, but you're probably just saying that because you don't really know what fretting is. Because we don't walk around talking about it. I literally Googled fretting, and all I could get was pictures of guitars. <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm like, fretting. You know, and I, I, nothing would come up except guitars. So then I typed in anxious, and I got some good pictures. Here, look at this. Th this, this is what it's like to be anxious right, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a male, whatever, and, and I've discovered a, a common thread. you got to put your hand on your head. Apparently, that's when you're really fretting. This is like, <laughs> uh. and, and I thought that was funny until I started thinking about what I do sometimes. I've literally been sitting at my desk. I've been sitting on the couch sometimes, and you're just like, Oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> it's like, and that, that's what it is. It, it, it means your mind is whirling. You're, you're letting circumstances and everything just dictate your emotions and your feelings. And it's, it's like saying, ah, something's got to stop this, right? That's what it means to fret. Well, fretting, actually the definition, it means to, const to be constantly, or get this, visibly worried. In other words, when you're fretting, it changes your demeanor. It changes your disposition. That's when somebody walks up, are you okay? Well, why are you asking? I mean, oh, I'm totally fine. No, you're not. Like, your face, like your, your smile is upside down. I mean, your eyes are half closed. You're, you've got your hand on your head. Like, what's wrong? You know, like it visibly changes your demeanor when you allow your thoughts and your emotions to just go crazy. So we've got to stop fretting. And so as I was kind of processing it this week, um, I, I felt like the, the Lord brought me to, to Psalms chapter 37. And, I, and I'm going to base my message off of this, this uh, portion of Scripture in uh, Psalms 37. And it's a little different because, first of all, this was a message that God was speaking to me very clearly. You know, there are some circumstances, there are some things that have gone on in, in my life, not just recently, but over months and months. 
And I don't know why. I just like, I lay in bed at night sometimes and I just replay these things. And I'm like, what could I have done different? What could I have changed? You know? And, and, and I just let it build up this anxiety where it's like, ah! And that's not what we're supposed to do. So the Lord brought me to this passage of Scripture. And this is David. And he's writing this. And, and what I love is, I, I feel like it comes more like from a, a father's heart. More than a like, you know, it's like, do not fret. But he's going, let, let me show you a better way. Because, you know, as parents, that's what we want to do. We don't want to just, you know, get out erotic correction and nah, tell our kids what to do or what they did wrong. No, we want to show them a better way. We want to help them make wise choices. And I feel like this is what this passage does, and it's beautiful. So I, I kind of want to read through it, and then I'm going to break it down a little bit. So we're going to start reading in verse 1. It says, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. And then he says, Trust in the Lord, and do good. Dwell in the land, and enjoy safe pasture. In other words, there's another way to do this. There's another way to live. You don't have to be in this world of fretting all the time. Verse 4, it says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Man, when you're fretting, you're not patient. You're not chill at all. You know, you've got yourself worked up. And then you try and get everybody else worked up around you. It says, refrain from anger. Turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. For those who are evil are going to be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek, they will inherit the land, and they will enjoy peace and prosperity. So here's David kind of laying out this concept. And I, I almost guarantee you he's laying it out because he found himself fretting. But then he's trying to share in song, listen, there's a better way. There's better seeds that you can sow than fretting. There's a better way to live than being anxious and freaking out. There's a much better way. And so I want to look at that a, a, a little bit here and, and just kind of address some of this. But first of all, the, the thing that I see in here, two out of the three times when he talks about do not fret, he talks about it because of our relationship with people. And I've discovered that the thing that makes most people fret the most, the thing that makes most people anxious is other people. Things they say. Things they don't say. Things they do. Things they don't do. Things you want them to do. Like it's, we, we've given like our emotional capacity to people. And we're allowing them to determine whether we even sleep at night. Whether we're going to have a good day or a bad day. Whether or not we're going to lose our peace just driving in the car from here to there. I'm sorry, there's a lot of out-of-town people that don't know how to use roundabouts. <laughs> just put that in your mind. Don't lose your peace when they about kill you in a roundabout. It's life. They're just figuring it out. You probably ra almost ran somebody over the first time you went through one, right? Now they're everywhere. You're used to it. You get how it works. They don't, right? But it's amazing how we just let people control how we feel, control how we think, and most importantly, dictate our emotional capacity for that day, for the week. For some of you, there's things you've been fretting about for months. You lay in bed and you think about what people have done or, or things that have happened, or you think about what you've done. And then you start thinking about what people think of you because you, you, you made a mistake once and you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I've made more than one mistake. But you know what I mean? Like we let this stuff build up. So again, Psalms 37, 1 and 2, do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. Can I tell you how many times I've heard Christians verbalize 
their jealousy of people in the world. What they have, how amazing their spouse is, the job, their position. I'm like, why? Why are we envious? Why are we looking at what the world has and feeling like we're missing out? It's not the way it's supposed to be. He goes on in in verse 7. It says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways. In other words, one of the things that's going to happen is you are going to lose your peace when you see people who don't know God doing things their own way succeeding. It doesn't mean that God's blessing them. So why do you care? Do you, do you want what they have? Or do you want God's blessing in your life? It's been a long time since I preached about what the blessing is. And man, we are so mixed up in this culture about what it means to be blessed by the Lord. Man, just knowing our name is written in the Lamb's book of life is a blessing. <laughs> Knowing that he will never leave us or forsake us is a blessing. Knowing that we can have peace in the middle of a storm is a blessing. Right now, knowing that he didn't call us to live in Florida, what a blessing. Like, look at what those people are going through down there. Can you imagine? And it's not because they all made a bunch of bad choices. It's circumstances. It's stuff. It's where God positioned them, and it stuff happens. Can you imagine if they all went, you know, went out and started getting upset at God? God, I pray that that hurricane wouldn't hit me. But it did. It was all over. So are you going to trust in God no matter what the circumstances are? Or are you going to let circumstances and people just rob you of your peace and your joy? We really don't have the power to dictate what people do in our lives. But we have the power to dictate what we allow God to do in our lives. So we've got to make sure that our hearts stay open to him. Here's what it says in Proverbs 23, 17, and 18. It says, do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Guess what? Their hope will be. Their stuff, everything they try and build up on this earth, without God, they will be cut off. But us will never be cut off. So our focus and our hope needs to be in, in the right thing. Proverbs 3, 31 and 34. Do not envy the violent or choose any other ways. For the Lord detests the perverse, but he takes the upright into his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks proud mockers, but he shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. I just want to keep my heart and my mind on God. I, I don't want to look to people. I don't want to let people dictate. My emotional capacity, my, my day, my, my feelings, none of that. Now, I'm not saying I don't want to be moved with empathy and compassion. I want the Holy Spirit to move me towards people to be a blessing, but I don't want people to move me and rock me of my peace and my joy and all of that kind of stuff. So if, if we go back to Psalms chapter 37, I, I, I kind of want to pull out a bunch of the, the right seeds that David says we need to sow. Because you can sow the wrong seeds and get the wrong result. In other words, your mind's going to go crazy. You're going to be, you know, constantly frustrated and fretting and trying to figure things out, trying to make things happen. I've discovered a lot, especially for me. I'm one of those guys who likes to fix things. And when I can't fix something, it's so frustrating. It's so humbling. But yet it's so good to humble yourself and realize that you can't fix everything. I can't fix myself. Man, there's times where I'm like, why am I thinking this way? Why am I talking this way? Why am I acting this way? Why can't I fix me? I can't. But I can put myself in a place where the Holy Spirit can fix me, where I can begin to tap into the mind of Christ and think like he thinks and act like he wants me to act and do what he wants me to do. So I do have the ability to put myself in that place. And that's what we need to do. So some of the seeds that, that David says, here, here's the first one. It's in verse 3 of Psalms 37. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Carla already referenced the psalm that we sang last week, week that she introduced. It was awesome. Almost every day this week, Carla, I found myself singing that song. I trust in, and I, and I, 
I almost said, I'm not going to say. <laughs> no. I'm completely tone deaf. You don't want to hear it. But it was coming out of me, right? I, I'm saying it. It's in my head. And, and, and I don't know why what's in here can't come out here the way it's supposed to. Because in my head, it's awesome. And I'm, I, like, I'm worshiping to that song. And I'm confessing it. And I'm speaking it. And, you know, it, and it's real good. But, <laughs> but I trust in God. Do you really trust in God? Do you? Or do you trust in your own abilities? Or do you trust in your finances? Or, or, or do you trust in your, in, in your business? Or do you trust in your spouse? Or do you, do you trust in, like, where do you put your faith, your hope, and your trust? Jeremiah 17, 5 says, this is what the Lord says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man who draws strength from mere flesh. That is a powerful statement. It's saying there is an incredible danger when you are trusting in yourself or mere flesh. When you are looking to somebody else and having your heart turn away from the Lord. I was talking with my mom this week. You know, don't have any kids in the house. So we had some, da- had some downtime because my wife was off uh, doing a, a women's thing. I'm like, I'll call my mom and dad. Hour and a half later, I'm like, wow. I guess I haven't talked to my mom in a while. But we're talking, right? And she starts to share this testimony. And it's powerful because she's like, you know, I've been working all day and, and, and I went to lay down. And she goes, all of a sudden, I just started feeling sick. She was like, the room started spinning. I felt really weird. I started feeling pain. She goes, I, I went out of the bedroom and, and I went and I sat down. And she goes, and I felt like I was going to get sick. And then all of a sudden, I felt this pain, like a paralysis, start coming up my leg. And she goes, just in that moment, just fear was gripping me. Like, what's going on in my body? And she goes, I was just about to cry out for my dad when it hit her. Wait a minute. My trust is in God. And so she just stopped, and she didn't cry out for my dad. She said, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I command this pain, whatever's going on in my body, to go. And the second she did, she goes, I felt it the same way it was coming out my leg. She goes, I felt it go down out of my leg. My head cleared up and everything was normal like that. I'm like, okay. I'm like, mom, you tell me a fib. I'm the pastor. And that's literally what was going through my mind. I'm like, my mom's fibbing me. Why would my 75-year-old mother lie to me? She's, <laughs> she's, pr- she's the one who prayed me <laughs> into the kingdom. <laughs> so she wasn't lying. She was saying, I realized in that moment, am I going to look to the natural and trust my husband to come and, and help me? And I'm not saying you can't do that. I mean, the Bible is pretty clear. It actually says if you're sick, call for the elders of the church. Get people to pray for you. But in that moment, she put her trust and her faith in God and instantly circumstances changed. That's what it means to trust in God. It means you're the one that is not in control. You know you can't change it. So you're like, okay, God, it's you. God, you've got to move. God, you've got to do something. I don't know what to do, so I am running to you. Psalms 91, 1 through 2 says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Again, there is this peace. There is this peace that comes when you take it out of your hands and you put it into God's. There's a peace that comes. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress in whom I trust. He's the one I look to. He's the one that I'm putting my faith and my trust in. Here, here, here's the, the second thing that David says is good seed to sow. He says in, in verse 4 of chapter 37, he says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So the seed to sow is to take delight in God. My question is, what do you delight in? The very definition of delight, it means great pleasure. Most people don't see time with God as great pleasure. Most people don't see coming to church as great pleasure. Most people don't don't see picking up the Bible and reading it as great pleasure. Like, I am so excited to go worship. I am so excited to get into the Word. But that's what David's saying. He's saying, come on, switch that pleasure button that you have, that you were created with, 
and start finding pleasure in the one who can actually fulfill your need and stop putting it in everything else. Stop trying to get your pleasure and your joy and your contentment out of your hobbies, out of your money, out of your stuff, out of, out of people. In other words, stop being an empty person who's going around trying to be filled on everybody else. Instead, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, and I want to clarify that verse because I think it's really important. He will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, when your, your heart's desire is his heart's desire, then everything you ask for lines up with him. So, of course, he's going to give you what's going to help you and minister to you in exactly what you need. In other words, you're not asking out of selfish motives. You're connected to his heart. Psalms chapter 42, verses 1 and 2. This is a great description of it right here. It says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. So I mentioned we don't have any kids in the home, but we got this like 80-pound dog. Big old hairy thing. But he doesn't shed much, which is awesome. But he does this thing, which is called panting. And it is really loud. And it's really obnoxious. Because he wants to fetch all day long. That's all he wants to do is fetch. That's where he finds his joy. So then it makes him pant. So he's, like, <laughs> so he's always panting. So then we have to go give him water. So what does he do? He runs to the water dish to try and get his fulfillment. And he sticks his big old face in it, gets it all over his beard, because that's what I call it, all his beard. His, his ears get in it, and he's just soaking it up, and then he sticks his head up, runs around, sprays water everywhere, gets his ball, runs and says, here, throw it again, right? And you're like, oh, it's sopping wet. But you see, that panting drew him to the water, which is what he needed for his body. Do you understand that if we would begin to hunger and thirst for God, if we would run to him, we would get everything that we need and then we can walk away and just shake it off on everybody else. <laughs> just kind of let it, let, let it be everywhere. Let that residue of the Holy Spirit just go everywhere, right? It's like, wow, you've been with God. You're so happy. You're so peaceful. Well, like, what's going on in your world? You, you should be, like, totally freaked out based on circumstances. But no, I'm just trusting God. I'm choosing to delight myself in Him. Because the second part of Psalms 42 is the second verse there. It literally says, when? My, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. But then, when can I go and meet with God? When? In other words, when you're delighting in him, whatever you delight, whatever you find great pleasure in, you go for it. You're all in. We were at Softies yesterday with some of our friends, and they all have these little kids. And Lori has this great idea. Hey, everybody, ju jump in the back of Danny's pickup truck. It's, it's a fun way to all be together. Like eight kids in the back of a pickup truck with ice cream cones. <laughs> dripping on the roof, on the bed, down the side of the car, down the windows. They were delighting themselves in softies, and they weren't thinking of anything else. They're just, it's just everywhere. I mean, that's how we should be. We should be so in love with Jesus that we're not thinking about anything else. And the residue of that is just everywhere. Here's the next thing that, that David says is, a, is an awesome seed to be sowing. In verses 5 and 6, he says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Commit your way to the Lord. There's something about committing your situation, your circumstances to God that just kind of nullifies fretting. It really does. That's why it says in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be. Quit fretting about anything. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Get it all out. Just commit to it. Commit it to him. Give it to him. Give everything to him. What does it look like to give him everything? Well, it means this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. 
we, we've heard this verse, but we don't really look at this one part. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him. You see, if you commit to God, if you're committing, it means submitting. That, that's what committing means. The word submission means to line yourself underneath. It's voluntarily putting yourself underneath of somebody else. So when you commit all the areas of your life, when you submit that to God, then that's where the true peace and blessing comes. So if you want to know if you're committed, then look at your life and see how submitted you are. Is every area of your life submitted to him? Every single area. Here, here's the next thing that David says is a seed that we're supposed to sow. In verse 7, he says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Be still before the Lord. I've discovered something. When my mind starts working, my body starts working. I start walking. I, I start like, th th when I fret, this is what I do. I walk. I have probably walked miles and miles and miles around this church. Something happens, and, and I just start, or I get on the phone, I start talking with people and their problems. I'm like, oh my goodness, here we go. And so you're like, all right. And, and I'm walking, and, I, and I'm fretting, and it's really hard to just shut everything down and just be still. We struggle with that. Why? Because we want to fix things. We want answers right now. Come on. Come on, God. I prayed. Prayed. Boom. Your turn. I didn't mind. Your turn. It's like, no, no. We need to just be still. We need, we need to allow God to do what only he can do. Psalms 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. In other words, there's this moment where if you're willing to shut everything down, you can truly begin to understand who God is. But if you try and just keep doing it all in your own, fretting, freaking out, trying to make things happen, trying to fix stuff, it's going to be hard. My, my, my favorite verse um, about being still is in, in Exodus. And I use this all the time when it comes to baptisms and stuff because it's so powerful. But in Exodus chapter 14, you've got the story of the Israelites. God, through Moses, is bringing them out of Egypt, and they come up to the Red Sea. So they got their past coming at them this way. They got nowhere to go ahead of them. It seems impossible. So what do they do? They start fretting. They start freaking out. Why did you bring us out here to die? God, why? How many times have we done that? God does a bunch of miraculous things. He saves us. He does stuff. Kind of pulls us out of our bondage. And then right away, we start blaming God for not doing more. As if salvation's not enough, you know, the, uh, the Israelites here, they literally say, we would have been better in bondage. That's, that's where their fretting got them. It got them into thinking that just literally didn't make sense. It made no sense. And so when we, when we look at it, here's what it says in, in verses uh, 13 through 15. It says, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still. Calm down. Pull it together. Snap out of it. Right? And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians, whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. It's going to be done. In other words, when God deals with it, it's finished. Isn't that powerful? Man, if you've never been baptized in this place since making Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I took that statement in that passage, and I went down to the Okori River in Tennessee, and I was so excited because when I climbed in that river, I said, all right, God, that's it. Everything from my past that's been hanging on to me, this is it. Once and for all, I am letting go of it. I'm tired of the mental battle. I'm tired of jumping back and forth. I want freedom. And I went into that river with that kind of faith, and man, I came out stirred up, excited, and free free in my mind, free to think clearly, free to walk out in the things that God had, to, had for me. It felt so good. And that's what he's, that's what he's telling them here. I go back to the passage and uh, put it back up there again. And it says, you'll see no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
Why are you crying out to me? (laughs) So Moses just told the people, y'all need to calm down. Y'all need to pull it together. You're freaking out. God's got it. Watch what he's going to do. And God says, hey, Moses, quit freaking out. (laughs) Pull it together. Lead by example. (laughs) Why are you crying out to me? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to move on. Move on. And so they took that step of faith, believing that God was going to do something. And God parted the sea, and they went across on dry land, and and their entire past came after them, and God wiped them all out, every last single one of them. Isn't that incredible? That's what God's able to do. But you've got to be willing to commit to him. So here's the next thing that David says. And it's in uh, verse 8 of uh, chapter 37. He says, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. In other words, he's saying, listen, you fret enough, you're going to get really irritable. You're going to get really agitated, and it's not going to be pretty. Anybody else done some not-so-pretty stuff when you're fretting turned to anger? Because normally when you get angry, you want to take it out on somebody or something. You take it out on somebody, you hurt people. You take it out on something, you usually hurt yourself. <laughs> right? Here's what it says in James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. It says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Why? Because when you sow seeds of anger, it does not produce the righteousness that God desires. When you let that anger and that frustration rise up in you, when you let that fretting get into anger, it totally messes with you. And it robs you of living the righteous life, of being the person that you're supposed to be. So we've got to make sure that we're not getting agitated, that we don't have those triggers, that we don't have those buttons, that we're not allowing anger to rise up. Anytime you you find yourself with a trigger or a button, whatever you want to call it, means it's time to go to God. Because you've got to get rid of that thing before you do something stupid. You'll either hurt others or you'll hurt yourself. And both of those actually hurt our reputation as Christians. Because we're supposed to be walking out in God's character Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, he says, get rid of it. Get rid of all bitterness, the rage, the anger, the brawling, the slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Because when you attack a person instead of a problem, you're sinning. That's not what we're called to do. That's that's not how we're called to live. And then here's the last seed that I see David encouraging us to walk out in and to sow. And it's simply this in uh, verse 11. It says, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. What's meekness? It's humility. It's humility. So we need to be humble. We need to understand that we're not as great as we think we are. We need to understand that we don't have the answer to everyone's problems. We, we, we got to understand that we can't fix everything. We need God. You may think you're a great husband. You may think you're a great wife. You may think you're a great friend. You may think you're a great student. There's only so much you can do in your own strength, and then you will fall short. But when you begin to humble yourself under God and say, God, I need you. I need your strength. I need your anointing. I need your wisdom. I need your input. I need what you have. When you're sowing those types of seeds, you are opening the door for the Holy Spirit to come in and give you exactly what you need. Psalms 25 verse 9 says this. It says, He guides the humble in what is right, and He teaches them His way. You know, the root word for humble in the Greek is humus which literally means to have your face down in the dirt. Now, that doesn't mean you think you're nothing. It means you realize that you're not everything. 
And humility, again, is when you're willing to say, okay, God, I need you. God, I, I need what you have. God, I need your people. I need to go to church today because I need people around me. God, I, I need to be in a worship environment. God, I, I need your word because my mind's not thinking clearly. I, I, I need what you have to offer. God, I, I need to spend time in your presence. I need this. That's what humility is. It's when you understand, wait a minute. God, I need you. He literally says this in James 4, 6. He gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. So when you're humble enough to say, God, I need you, that's an open door for him to show up. When you're humble enough to say, I can't figure this out. I keep falling into the same thing. I keep doing the same thing. I, I, I keep messing up. When you're willing to humble yourself and say, God, I need you, that's when he shows up. That's why the Bible says in our weakness, that's when he's able to be strong. Because that's when he's going to get the glory and not you. And I want to close with a story out of Luke chapter 10. It's a story... I think most of you have probably heard the story of Mary and Martha. But I, I want to read it again in light of what we're talking about. Verse 39 says, As Jesus uh, and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Verse 39. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. So what was Mary's rhythm of life? Spending time at the feet of Jesus. That's literally how she's described. <laughs> what do you know about Mary? Well, she likes to sit at the feet of Jesus. What do you know about Martha? She's very distracted, right? Verse 40, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha's literally trying to make Mary come into her world of fretting. Come fret with me. Come freak out with me. Come be overwhelmed with me. Come take on the weight that I'm carrying. That's what we do. And we want people to be sympathetic. And we just, we, we try to, and we get frustrated. Why don't you feel my fretting? Why won't you fret with me? It is so hard to fret with someone. That sounds funny. But it is hard to fret with someone when you know what God's word says. Because you know the answer. And why would I only focus on the problem when I know the one who is the answer? Why would I sit there and just keep going over all the reasons why God can't when I know all the reasons why God can and why he will, right? And Jesus just goes, Martha, Martha, <laughs> you are worried and you're upset about many things. He's like, lady, you've got this fretting thing figured out. You are the best fretter I've ever met. <laughs> you know how to take any small problem and make it big. You know how to take anything and just make it, you know, harder than it needs to be. I'm like, stop it. Stop making it so impossible. And he goes, but few things are needed. Actually, indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better. And that's not going to be taken away from her. In other words, when you choose to not fret, to not freak out, when you choose to step away from circumstances and all the cares and the concerns of this life, and you just sit at the feet of Jesus... Nobody can take that peace away from you. Nobody can take that joy away from you. Nobody can take the contentment away that comes from you. Nobody can take the strength away that comes from sitting at his feet. Nobody can take the understanding, the intimacy. They can say whatever they want about my God, but I know him. I've been with him. I know his voice. I know it. Do you? Let's stand up in this place today.
I feel like the encouragement is just so simple that David's giving us. Don't fret. But instead of fretting, how about you start doing some of these other things? How about you start sowing some of the right seeds? In other words, why don't you just draw near to God? Why don't you just draw near to Him and let His love and His peace and His promises begin to be where you find your source of hope and strength? 